Hello and welcome to 15 Minutes in the Forest. I'm Karen Snape with Virginia Cooperative Extension and today we're going to be learning a little bit about sawing and drying lumber that you would cut from logs uh, yourself. This is something that homeowners and woodworkers and enthusiasts can do using a portable sawmill and air drying in a solar kiln. Um, we're not going to go into deep into the specifics of how to use any one portable sawmill. The best place for information on that is your owner's manuals, which you can often find online or by contacting the manufacturer. Those are going to tell you all of the safety precautions you need to take, um, including PPE that you should wear, how to set up, use, and care for your equipment. Um, so we're not going to go into great detail on that, but we are going to have some good video and learn some generalities. So let's do that. Here are some of the parts of the sawmill. Those posts keep the log from rolling off when it's loaded or turned. This part turns the log. Those teeth will grab it and force it around to turn. We'll see that a little bit later. And here you can see the blade of the sawmill. Uh, it runs past those little pulleys and tensioners and cuts the wood. There are weights hanging down that help to hold the board in place as it's cut, keep it from kicking back or shifting. The blade goes all the way around in a big loop, returning to the other side behind that red guard with the yellow sticker. And here's another sawmill. This one has uh, those arms that look kind of like hockey sticks. Those are log loading arms. They're hydraulically controlled. So you roll the log onto them and then they lift and tumble the log onto the track of the sawmill. And here you can see that arm that comes up, the log turner in the down position. So it looks a little bit different than the one we saw before, smaller teeth on it, but that's what that is. And you can also see here the little uh, posts that would come up, the um, log uh, stops in the down position as well as the other log dogs and tabs that are in the down position here on this sawmill. This sawmill also has a hydraulic sections on the sawmill to lift one end of the log to make it more um, level and make sure you're getting that log through um, perfectly longitudinally. Uh, if that's what you want to do. So a little bit fancier, but all the same components as the sawmill we saw at my friend's house. Uh, the blade has been removed from this one. Um, I think they're sharpening it over the winter, but you can still see where it would go around, where it would come back, the motor, the engine that drives everything, where the fuel goes, and then that empty shelf over on the right would hold a water reservoir. Often people will put a little bit of oil also in that water that drips down onto the saw blade, keeps it lubricated, and most importantly keeps it cool um, so that it doesn't get hot with friction and uh, warp or swell and not go through the wood evenly. Um, here you also can see the controls used to um, operate this, this sawmill. Um, it doesn't have a dial to control the height. It has a, more of a vertical chart. And then here on the sides are some charts somebody's posted showing uh, the different types of boards that they're gonna be cutting, uh, you know, two by fours, one by sixes, stuff like that. And that is another sawmill. Here is my friend using a tractor to load the logs onto the portable sawmill bed. This is what you'll need to do if you don't have those hydraulic arms to uh, lift the logs on, using some chains and putting that uh, up there on the sawmill where it needs to be. Here we have the first pass with the saw you can see that the saw moves along the log instead of the log moving through a commercial sawmill. We are removing the bark and the top slab of wood. It's going to be a sort of 
curved bark on one side and flat on the other. We'll see my friend remove the slab and that leaves a flat surface. Now the turner is coming up, it turns the log and now the log dogs will come over, little pieces that hold the log into, in place as we prepare for the next pass with the saw. Fast forwarding a little bit, here is the log with three of the slabs removed and the fourth slab is being sawed off now. This will result in a square cant that can then be sawed into boards. Here that is from another point of view. Uh, my friend is new at this, he's getting a little instruction. But there he goes, cutting through to remove that last slab. You can see the sawdust coming out the left side of the sawmill as that goes down. Sometimes people will hang a bucket there to catch that and uh, pile it up someplace instead of just letting it uh, go out in the, on the ground in a line. So he raised the saw blade and he puts my friend to remove that slab. And here is the cant being cut into boards. There's a dial on the right side of the sawmill that tells you the height of the blade which tells you the depth of your cut and the thickness of your board. So here he goes um, making another cut to uh, remove another board from the cant. For comparison, this is what happens at a commercial sawmill. The blades are all safely hidden behind guards, but you can see that the cants are moving through the blades, and in this case, four boards are being cut at one time. Here's the pile of slabs. Uh, this is pretty much just waste. My friends will probably uh, cut it up to use as firewood. In a commercial mill, it might be used in a boiler to heat or run equipment. Those are the slabs. So here are the boards from that day. You can see that there's sort of a variety of dimensions. Uh, some of the boards are wider or uh, thicker than others, but those will go home uh, to my friend's house and get stacked neatly for drying. Here are those boards stacked at my friend's house. He later covered them with a tarp to keep them out of the weather. Uh, you can see that there are spacers between layers of boards to allow for air circulation. Those small, very small little boards used as spacers are called sticks or stickers. And we'll get another look at that and you can see how those are arranged for air drying of your lumber. Here are some stacks of boards drying at a commercial sawmill I toured. Uh, one of the things I want you to notice here is that the stickers are placed directly above and below each other in a column. This places the weight of the stack of boards on the stickers. If the stickers were offset, then that weight would come down alternating and cause the boards to dry in a wavy, warped way. Trees, just like human beings and all other living things, have water in them, moisture in them. And then after a tree dies, it slowly loses that moisture, dries out, and comes closer to whatever the ambient uh, humidity is. And so you can air dry lumber, um, but that will only get it so dry. Our houses are drier than the natural environment here in Virginia because we heat them with heat, heating and air conditioning also will dry out the air in your house. So in order to get your lumber down to that humidity, you need to keep the boards either inside. If you've got a single project you're working on, you can stack them behind the couch or under the bed like a friend of mine used to do. Um, but if you are trying to dry lumber more in bulk, either for sale or for a larger scale woodworking, then you may want to invest in a solar kiln 
And we'll hear more about that from an expert. This is Dr. Brian Bond in Sustainable Biomaterials here at Virginia Tech. So the reason dry kilns are used in, in the wood industry or if you're um, going to sell your lumber to the woodworking market is any indoor furniture needs to be at a moisture content between about 6 and 8 uh, percent. And in air drying, an air drying situation here in Virginia, probably the lowest that you would get it is somewhere between 12 and 14 percent. So if you were to take that wood inside after air drying and make something out of it, it would shrink uh, in, in your home. So you're going to need some type of kiln whether it's a solar kiln, a dehumidification kiln, or uh, any kind of kiln, to lower the moisture content of the lumber so that it's ready, readily to be used uh, for an indoor environment. Here's the outside of the solar kiln at Virginia Tech. You can see that the roof is slanted to catch the light. Um, this would face whatever direction gets the most sun uh, in your location. That would probably be south or west in most of Virginia, but if you have a building or something else in your way, you just want to get them as much light as you can striking that side of the roof. It kind of looks like metal in this picture, but you'll see from the inside there, you can see that it is corrugated plastic, clear corrugated plastic to let in the light, which is the heat source for the kiln, a solar light. And you can see the inside is painted black to um, increase that heat absorption and the, the heat in there that's going to help drive off some of that moisture. You can see here that there are fans in the solar kiln, so you will need electric hookup. It's not completely passive solar. You need to be able to run those fans. You see the vents on the outside. That is where the air is exchanged, so you want the air that has absorbed all the moisture to move out and um, fresh air to move in. And so the fans help to do that and keep the air moving over the wood, drying the wood. There are a number of modifications that you can make to a solar kiln. Uh, a common one is using a timer on the fans so that the fans don't run at night, um, drawing in the cooler, damper night air. Um, other things are, might include um, installing a humidity reader. Uh, that blue tarp comes down and forms like a baffle so that the air flow goes through the stack of boards and not, you know, sneaks around someplace where the boards aren't. But you can learn a lot more about building one of these. There are plans on the Virginia Tech and Virginia Cooperative Extension websites that I'll link to in the chat. And the folks over there at Sustainable Biomaterials are experts in this and can advise you in this if this is the way that you want to go to dry your wood. Yeah, so this is a, our experimental dry kiln. It's a scaled down model of what's used in the actual industry. We use it for research and extension uh, purposes, helping folks out with schedules and drying issues. Um, it's a little bit probably more capital intensive than what you would use for a portable sawmill because it is uh, heated with a boiler. So the boiler provides steam for us to for the heating purposes and also for conditioning at the end of the drying process. But it kind of gives you an idea of, of the scale that you could utilize um, for drying options in, in portable sawmilling. You know, you could take something like this and put a DH unit and a dehumidification unit uh, in it instead of of, uh, of a steam unit and lower the initial capital cost. Thank you for joining me for 15 Minutes in the Forest. Please come back in two weeks to hear from Bill Worrell on another interesting topic and every two weeks throughout the spring.